Hello everyone. Welcome to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at Ilo Pathology. Today's topic is diabetic nephropathy. In this particular topic, we will be discussing in detail about the morphology of diabetic nephropathy. But then before that, we will understand the pathogenesis of complications in diabetes. I am not talking about the pathogenesis of diabetes per se, but then we will understand how the complications occurs whenever there is a case of hyperglycemia. And then we will move on to understand the morphology of diabetic nephropathy. Now diabetes mellitus as we all know it's a common and a very serious metabolic condition which is characterized by chronic hyperglycemia and glucose intolerance which is basically due to impaired insulin action and or impaired insulin secretion. Majority of the patients are affected by micro and macrovascular complications. It is the microvascular complications which has a significant morbidity which are the causes for significant morbidity whereas the macrovascular complications most of the mortality in diabetic patients are due to macrovascular complications. And one of the important microvascular complications which we are interested in today's topic is diabetic nephropathy. Now before we understand the morphology of diabetic nephropathy let us understand why micro and macrovascular complications arise in diabetes. Now, glucose derived metabolites like glyoxal, methyl glyoxal and 3-deoxyglucosone, you know, they combine with amino groups of intracellular and extracellular proteins. Okay? This is a non-enzymatic process. You don't need any enzymes for this you know, combination of glucose and proteins. And these are referred to as advanced glycation end products or AGEs. This can happen even with the, even in individuals with normal glucose levels. But then the amount of AGEs formed are very 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 less significant for it to cause damage. Now what happens when there is hyperglycemia as in the case of diabetes? Whenever there is hyperglycemia that means there will be increased levels of glucose derived metabolites right and once there are in once there is increased levels of glucose derived metabolites these can non enzymatically you know combine and then result in increased advanced glycation end products one of the important pathogenetic mechanism for microvascular and macrovascular complications in diabetes now what does this advanced glycation end products do let us understand in short advanced glycation end products are AGE okay now let us see what this AGE does to a given cell and this cell could be a macrophage could be a T cell could be endothelial cell or vascular smooth muscle cell okay these cells have receptors for AGE and they are known as RAGE means receptor for AGE okay the macrophages, the endothelial cells and the vascular smooth muscle cells, they have receptors. So whenever there is a receptor like an interaction, what happens? So that leads to lot of reactions within the cell, so which further leads to release of cytokines and growth factors. The macrophages or endothelial cells, you know, they release cytokines and growth factors. The most important ones being the transforming growth factor beta, which results in deposition of excess basement membrane material. So that is what results in basement membrane thickening. So the other growth factor which are released are the vascular endothelial growth factor which has a role in the pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy which we will not be discussing in today's tutorial. This interaction also results in generation of reactive oxygen species in endothelial cells. They are also responsible for increased procoagulant activity. And they also lead to proliferation of vascular smooth muscle cells and synthesis of extracellular matrix. All these things combined, you know, they result in damage of the blood vessels. They result in microangiopathy and vessel injury. Remember, all these things happen because of interaction between a receptor and a ligand, right, on a given cell. So that's why these effects are receptor mediated effects. Receptor immediated effects of advanced glycation end products. Now, they not only act via receptors, they can also act without receptors and they are known as non receptor mediated effects. Okay, what do they do? The AGEs they directly cross link extracellular matrix proteins. They don't need any receptors for that to happen, they directly cross link these matrix proteins. Let us understand one by one. 
if consider a matrix protein called type 1 collagen which will be present in the walls of large blood vessels when these advanced glycation end products directly cross link this type 1 collagen what happens that results in decrease in the elasticity of the given blood vessel once there is decrease in elasticity these vessels are predisposed towards shear stress and endothelial injury so endothelial injury occurs that's what happens when there is cross linking between AGE and type 1 collagen similarly whenever there is cross linking between AGE and type 4 collagen the type 4 collagen is present is a constituent of basement membrane so when this cross link happens remember these are non receptor mediated ones when this cross link happens they result in decreased endothelial cell adhesion and that results in increased extravasation of fluid these extracellular matrix proteins when they are cross linked with AGEs they are referred to as AGE modified matrix components okay apart from these things which they do they also trap non glycated plasma proteins or interstitial proteins one such example is ldl protein low density lipoproteins okay so when they are trapped what happens there will be cholesterol deposition in the tunica intima and that results in acceleration of atherosclerosis and that is the reason why in diabetics they are more prone for accelerated atherosclerosis coming to renal vasculature which is what today's topic is about right the same thing happens even in the renal vasculature whether it is receptor mediated or non receptor mediated ultimately there will be microangiopathy what in microangiopathy there will be deposition of basement membrane there can be macrovascular injury in the form of vascular smooth muscle proliferation the endothelial cells can be damaged okay these things happen not only this the glycated basement membrane that is type 4 collagen they can trap albumin also okay and this albumin when it is cross linked with the collagen glycated basement membrane they result in basement membrane thickening so the basement membrane thickening not only happens because of receptor mediated effect that is because of release of tgf beta which helps in deposition of excess basement membrane basement membrane thickening is partly due to you know accumulation of albumin on the glycated basement membrane okay so this is a mechanism for basement membrane thickening apart from advanced glycation end products in diabetics hyperglycemia also leads to activation of protein kinase c whenever there is intracellular hyperglycemia that results in de novo synthesis of diacylglycerol which increases this protein kinase c activation now what does this protein kinase c do they stimulate the vascular endothelium which in turn releases these factors they release lots of vascular endothelial growth factor the transforming growth factor beta and the procoagulant plasminogen activator inhibitor 1 okay so all these things again result in microangiopathy okay remember microangiopathy is not only due to advanced glycation in products it's also because of activation of protein kinase c other thing which happens in diabetes is they are more prone for oxidative stress injury now let us understand how this happens so whenever there is intracellular hyperglycemia more and more glucose if it is there in the body if it is there within the cell they are converted to sorbitol which is a polyol which then further gets converted to fructose and for this conversion you need aldose reductase now aldose reductase does not convert sorbitol to fructose just like that it needs NADPH okay so NADPH is very much needed for this reaction to happen now NADPH is utilized in the conversion of sorbitol to fructose now why am I worried about this because NADPH is also used by this enzyme called glutathione reductase what does that do that converts oxidized glutathione to reduce glutathione by utilizing NADPH okay now we all know reduced glutathione is a very potent antioxidant and you know what is the function of antioxidant right it protects the cells from the oxidative injury oxidative stress injury understanding these things let us club together what would you understand whenever there is sustained hyperglycemia that results in significant decrease in the NADPH 
and that results in significant decrease in the production of reduced glutathione which means the individuals the cells are more susceptible for the oxidative stress now we understood the mechanism of stress the microangiopathy in diabetes now let us move on directly to understanding diabetic nephropathy diabetic nephropathy is a chronic progressive disease of the kidney which develops over a period of time the peak incidence is seen after 10 to 20 years after the onset of diabetes you know because there is persistent exposure to increased blood glucose levels and because of increased high blood glucose levels that leads to damage and disruption of renal cellular architecture and microvasculature the mechanisms which we had discussed just now right what are the clinical features there will be progressive increase in the excretion of urinary albumin and elevated blood pressure the morphology of diabetic nephropathy the lesions are similar irrespective of type of diabetes whether it is type 1 diabetes mellitus or type 2 diabetes mellitus now what are the morphology the morphology includes glomerular lesions the vascular lesions and tubular and interstitial lesions what are the glomerular lesions it could be capillary basement membrane thickening diffuse mesangial sclerosis nodular glomerulosclerosis or and diffuse glomerulosclerosis the vascular lesions predominantly is highly in arteriolosclerosis the tubular and interstitial lesions are it could be pyelonephritis it can be acute or chronic pyelonephritis with or without papillary necrosis it can be interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy particularly in the later lesions let us understand this one by one capillary basement membrane thickening we know the mechanism right whether it is receptor mediated or non receptor mediated there will be thickening of basement membrane that is what you see on histology there will be diffuse thickening of basement membrane of the glomerular capillaries second one is diffuse mesangial sclerosis that's because of deposition of matrix we know while understanding the pathogenesis there will be increased synthesis of extracellular matrix proteins right that is what happens there is pas positive deposits in the mesangium that results in diffuse mesangial sclerosis now diffuse glomerulosclerosis what does that mean that means more than 50% of the glomeruli show global glomerulosclerosis global means the entire glomeruli is sclerosed that too when you see more than 50% of them having global glomerulosclerosis then you call it as diffuse glomerulosclerosis the most important one is the nodular glomerulosclerosis these are spherical or ovoid or nodular deposition of the matrix in the mesangium they are characteristically referred to as kimmel steel wilson nodules named after these two people paul kimmel steel who is a, who was a german born pathologist in usa secondly clifford wilson was an english physician now what are these kimmel steel wilson lesions so these are the kimmel steel wilson wilson lesions which are laminated if you do a pa stain this stain pas pyruvic acid schiff reagent stain they are pas positive which are situated at the periphery of the glomeruli okay they are situated at the periphery of the glomeruli they lie in the mesangium as a cellular matrix or a cellular or hyaline matrix core the surrounding capillaries may be dilated you know they are patent which are sometimes dilated capillary loop because they are seen in between these capillaries they are also referred to as intercapillary glomerulosclerosis they are both the same kimmel steel wilson lesion the nodular glomerulosclerosis the intercapillary glomerulosclerosis are one and the same what are these they are accumulations of mesangial particles along with collagen fibrils lipid droplets sometimes very rarely cellular debris though we say it's predominantly acellular now if these nodules are stained by mason trichrome look at this how beautifully they take these stain so these are a w lesion or nodules stained by mason trichrome stain these are pas positive nodules so that's another stain pyruvic acid schiff methionine stain that's pasm stain so all these are special stains you know used to demonstrate these nodules now what are the other glomerular lesions other than the classical nodular glomerulosclerosis these lesions are called insudative lesions 
because these are intramural accumulations of plasma proteins which are nothing but the hyaline material and lipids which are seen in arterioles renal arterioles the glomerular capillaries the baumann's capsule or the proximal convoluted tubules okay if these are seen on the baumann's capsule they are called as capsular drop lesions look at this this is one hyaline material which is seen dropping from the glomerular baumann's capsule right so baumann's capsule that's a called that's called as capsular drop the lesions in the glomerular capillaries are known as fibrin cap so you can find similar lesions which is capping the capillaries they are called fibrin cap lesions but remember fibrin is a misnomer okay it does not contain fibrin hyalinosis is a preferred term by some authors now that's what we studied moving on to vascular lesions the most predominant uh, feature is the hyaline arteriolosclerosis which may involve both afferent and efferent arterioles look at this the hyalinization of the efferent and the afferent vessels are a characteristic feature in the vascular lesions tubular lesions and interstitial lesions it can have pyelonephritis as i told you it can be both i mean it can be either acute or chronic with or without papillary necrosis they also can have interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy in the later lesions look at this so these are the nodules which we the glomerular lesions this is sort of completely sclerosed glomeruli too many nodules and completely sclerosed one nodule here look at this lots of chronic inflammatory cell infiltrates in the interstitium that's chronic pyelonephritis this is the summary of the diabetic nephropathy where we understood the concepts of mechanisms you know involved in microangiopathy and the various lesions the glomerular lesions the vascular lesions and tubular and interstitial lesions now let me explain uh, the diabetic uh, nephropathy in one of the virtual slides from pathpresenter.net look at this in this field you can see the glomeruli right you can see the glomeruli and the tubules and the interstitium this is showing the nodules the nodular glomerulosclerosis again this is again showing a nodular glomerulosclerosis can you make out this hyalinization of the vessel arteriolosclerosis can you make out this there is a drop from the baumann's capsule that's capsular drop that's another capsular drop there a capsular drop the entire glomeruli is involved so this is a global glomerulosclerosis that's another beautiful nodule and hyalinized arteriole and can you make out in this field lots and lots of chronic inflammatory cell infiltrates that's evidence of chronic pyelonephritis i think so that completes the understanding of diabetic nephropathy particularly the morphology of diabetic nephropathy thank you for watching if you have liked this video please hit the like button do comment if you have any queries please do subscribe don't forget to share if you find this video useful i think in the next few tutorials i will come out with some other concepts of diabetic lesions thank you